Hi, I'm John P. And many of you have been asking me which watches are on your short list for the next purchase. Well, in this video, I'm going to tell you. Roll the intro. And we're back, you're chatting with John P. Today we're going to talk about some watches that I have on my list of future purchases. While I do want to tell you that not all of these watches are crazy in price, I mean most of these are, are easily attainable by a guy with a job, but of course they are a bit higher end, um, but that's why we have wish lists, right? So let's roll into it, but first... I want to thank you for liking and subscribing. Make sure to hit that subscription button. Many of you have already done so, and I do appreciate it, and it keeps me moving because it's nothing is greater than seeing more subs, which tells me that you like what you see. So if you do, please do subscribe, and I do appreciate it. It'll keep me working for you. And also, don't forget to check out DelrayWatch.com. We have so many cool watches. And actually, we had a few of these um, on my list at DelrayWatch.com. I don't know why I didn't keep any of them, but, um, you know, we'd rather deliver the value to you. So check it out, DelrayWatch.com. Going into the wristwatch check, I've got a vintage Speedmaster, the old 145-022 on the wrist. Um, this one's from 1970, so it's a little bit of an interesting bird here. It's got the step dial. I don't want to give away too much about it because I am going to be doing a video when I work out the camera angles. You know, I'm not really like a cinematographer or, or a professional photographer, but I'm working on it, so bear with me. I will be doing some close-up shots of this in the near future. So let's get into the list, right? That's why you're here. You want to see what watches are on my short list of future purchases. And by future, I mean probably in the next year. It's not that I couldn't purchase any of these on the list because, you know, I can, no problem. But it is just because with DelrayWatch.com, we get so many watches through the door. My personal collection is honestly really not that, of, it's not of that much interest to me because I would rather be finding cool watches for you. So let's get into the list. The first is a vintage piece. And this watch was produced for about 25 years. So it really... It really covered a vast period of time, and this is going to be the Rolex Explorer 1016. Now, when someone thinks of a Rolex Explorer, you either think of the 14270, which is kind of the original um, modern version with the when they first switched over to the Sapphire Crystal, or you think of the 1016, which just ha took up such a huge period of time in Rolex's history, and actually it shared the same case or at least case profile and shape as the Rolex Datejust for, uh, I think, the 1603 for quite a long time. So it's interesting in that regards. But what really draws me to it is it's just the quintessential, like, iconic, vintage, understated sports watch. So, of course, it has a cr acrylic crystal. But on top of that, you also have the very familiar and traditional Rolex Explorer dial with the numbers and there's just something about this that really draws me to it. When people think of Rolex, they don't always think of an Explorer. And that's what I like about it, right? Like anyone can look on your wrist, they can see a date just, and they can say, hey, that's a Rolex. Or they see a day date, or they see a sub. Of course, if they see a sub, they, um, you know, they know it's a Rolex. But what I like about the Explorer, and especially a vintage Explorer, is while it obviously is great collector value and they're only skyrocketing in price especially the last few years i mean a good example depending on the year it can be over 10k no problem it, it just it's understated and not everyone knows what it is it's kind of one of those things where you just have to look a little bit closer and you really have to know what you're looking at to know what you're looking at if you catch my drift so that's why i like that one and that's first on the list if I find a good example, I'll be picking it up any day, but these have become so hot recently, I don't know if I'll find a good example at a reasonable price in the near future, but if I do, it will be in my rotation. So rolling into a higher end piece, but at a very low price, surprisingly, um, you know, compared to what the retail value is when you get these pre-owned or gray market, is a Parmigiani Calpa. Now, Parmigiani Fleurier makes 
amazing watches. I've been to their boutiques. I've been to some of their events. We've been invited to some of their events and they have these little parties at the boutique in the design district in Miami and they show off their, some of their best pieces and they really do make some amazing watches. The cases are finished to the T. I mean, the way that they finish these cases is up there with the best and considering what they charge for these watches, more so in the secondary and pre-owned market, gray market, uh, the value is insane. I personally owned a Parmigiani Kalpa and I loved it. And I'm not sure why I sold it. You know, um, I loved the thing, but the, I don't know what it was. It came on an Hermes strap. And while the Hermes strap was very high quality, it just didn't, it didn't sit well with my wrist. I think I had the XL and the, the normal size of the Parmigiani Kalpa fits a little bit better. So I'd probably you know, lean in that direction just because I have a smaller wrist and, you know, it's got kind of that to no um, rectangle -ish shape and the lugs kind of arch over. So I would probably go for the smaller size, but guys, I mean, in-house movement, very refined, uh, very few pieces per year. I mean, we're talking in the low thousands of pieces. These things, they're very high quality. There's a picture here. If you haven't seen Parmigiani Fleurier, check them out. They make an amazing watch, and if you get them pre-owned, I mean, we're talking $3,000 roughly. We just sold one for about $3,000. This is a watch that rivals a $20,000 watch from any high-end, you know, manufacturer here. I mean, in-house movement, very high, um, you know, decoration on the movements. If you get an older one, it's got a gold rotor. The look at the pictures. I'm going to put a movement shot here so you see what I'm talking about. Very amazing watch. Let's go into the next one. <laughs> now, I know I'm going to get some heat for this. You're going to call me a fanboy. You're going to say, oh, everybody wants it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, I kind of want one. You know, we've, we've had them. We've had them through the doors. I personally have not owned one of these, but I would like to own one. And I don't really know if it's because I want to wear it or if it's because I just want to hold on to it as a collector's item. I'm not sure, but for whatever reason, I am drawn to this watch. It's a Patek Nautilus. Now, I would go with a Blue Dial 5711, as would anyone else, and I also would go with a Tiffany Dial 5711 if I could get one. So, Kelly, if you're watching this, hook a brother up. Nonetheless, it's, it's no doubt one of the most desirable watches that you can find. It, it just is. The Patek 5711 Blue Dial is the hottest watch on the market. They're trading at double premium, double sealed, forget about it. We sold a double sealed one a while ago and it was so hard to find, but now it's, it, forget about it, you can't find it. And so when you look at the watch, obviously it's very high quality. It's a Patek Philippe, it's a Nautilus, it's a sports line. So sure, it, some of the case finishing might not be there compared to the, some of the more, um, contemporary dress watches that are very high complication, but I mean, we're talking a Patek Sports watch. It's a Nautilus. Just saying the word Nautilus is getting me a little bit going, if you know what I mean. Guys, what do you think about the Nautilus, actually? Leave in the comments below how you feel about the Nautilus. I can go all, on all day, but it's very obvious that probably the majority of people watching this video can go on with their opinions on this one, and it's controversial, right? Like, are you willing to pay double? I personally am not willing to pay double retail for this watch, and that's why I don't have one. If I can get one at retail, I would buy one, but I'll admit, I can't get one at retail right now. I have to wait, like the rest of everyone else, because I am not buying, you know, five, six, seven Padex per year. So let me know in the comments below what you think about the 5711, and if you would add this to your collection. So, the next one. Now, I've got the list right here, and I forgot I had this on my list because I briefly owned this watch as well. And to tell you the truth, just like the Parmigiani Kalpa, I really don't know why I got rid of it. Um, it's the FP Journe Elegant 48. Now, basically what this is, it's if you're familiar with FP Journe, it's the Vagabondage 3, but in a quartz version. And if you're into FP Journe, and if you're into high-end watches, and you don't necessarily mind owning a quartz version, it's an amazing watch. It really is. The quality is up there. 
basically up there with the rest of his offerings. Sure, you have the quartz movement, and the interesting thing about this quartz movement, actually, and I need to touch on this, is when you set the watch down, it some way knows with its proprietary quartz movement system that you're not wearing it, and it stops working. And what this means is the battery, I believe, lasts about eight years with everyday use because when you take the watch off at night, it stops working and it's able to draw less power from the movement's power system in the battery. So that's kind of unique, right? I think there's probably, there might be one or two other watches in kind of the watch space that do that as well. They're not coming to my head right now because I'm not the biggest quartz advocate, but when we're talking about a manufacturer like FP Jorn, I mean, this watch is amazing. Sure, it's 48, but it, it, it wears closer to like a modern day maxi case sub. It's a really great watch, guys. And considering the price, I mean, we're talking, I think it has a retail. I don't think you can buy it retail anymore unless you get lucky, but 12K, in the 12K range, and I've seen these trade as low as 8,500 pre-owned. So if you get an FP Jorn for $8,500 and you're getting something, in my opinion, that is extremely unique, special, and will be a part of watchmaking history in the future when FP Jorn, because this will happen, FP Jorn will be um, a legend. He's al It's already a living legend, but at some point, you know, unfortunately when you know he does move on, FP Jorn watches are going to fetch crazy premiums, and I do not think that the FP Jorn Elegant 48 will be an exception, and that's why I would love to add it to my collection. I just would. It'd be amazing. So, let's go on to the next one. Now, this watch is a little more attainable for everybody here because it is from the Nomos manufacturer. So, this one is a Nomos Club. So it's a Nomos Club, and it's the limited edition made for Amsterdam-based Ace Jewelers. Now, if you're not familiar with the Nomos Club, basically it's their entry-level piece, and now the Nomos Club, which is 38.5 millimeters roughly, they now feature a alpha movement. Now, this is Nomos' first in-house caliber. They used to use, um, you know, base, smaller, manual wind um, peso movements. They've moved on to their in-house for their entry-level pieces. They started around fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars, I believe, depending on which one it is, as well as the case back and, and different things. Nomos is always changing that, especially the offerings with the case backs and the, and um, some of the dial combinations. But um, this one is just amazing. So what you have is you have a black dial. They already offer a black dial on this watch, but the numbers are red, and to me that just it just screams beautiful watch like. For for the price, I think you can probably get these pre-owned, twelve hundred dollars, thirteen hundred dollars, and to have a watch that looks like this, you got a California dial or California esque dial. You got the black on red. It's very casual. It's very edgy. You have an in-house movement, and and also what's unique about this one is on the crown it has the triple X, and the triple X is what Amsterdam has on their crest, and it has something to do with, I believe, the Austrian um, flag and something about, um, you know, Austrian being, Austria being part of Amsterdam at a certain point. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not a big history buff, but nonetheless, the triple X on the crown is very cool because it kind of transforms a basic Nomos into something more unique and special. The thing with Nomos is, while they do make very nice watches, they especially the club, tend to be more of an entry-level watch. So if you're a guy that doesn't necessarily focus on entry-level watches, I don't mind having a couple entry-level um, you know, watches in my collection, but to have kind of some of the Nomos branding removed is not the worst thing because it makes it unique and special, right? Like if you're a guy that has some higher-end pieces, maybe you have 5711s, maybe you have Rolexes, and you want kind of a casual wear, you don't necessarily want to have... Um, the normal everyday basic watch like right you like you probably at least myself i would rather have something a little more unique a little more special otherwise you have exactly what everyone else has is, has and it's an entry level watch so i'm not talking down on it because i personally love nomos i was one of the first purchasers of a nomos watch when the tetra came out many years ago before they were using in-house movement so i'm certainly an advocate of the brand i haven't stuck with them in my collection throughout the years because i don't agree with what they've done with their pricing 
but they are keeping up with modern times and in the modern day trends for watches so i can't knock them on that for you know certainly for business reasons but nonetheless if you're in into these kind of um i don't want to say off brand but these less popular brands that but having a little interesting twist on it i would absolutely recommend this watch and that's why it's on my list right because i think it's unique it's special it's got an in-house movement and for like 1200 bucks pre-owned us dollars so that's 1200 us dollars how can you go wrong and so that's why it's on my list if if i can find this one it's only a limited edition of 75 pieces so i don't know if i'll be able to find it but if I can, I will be snapping it up right away because it's a cool watch to wear to the beach or something. And I'll, I mean, I'm wearing casual attire, right? Like it would look perfect on, you know, something that I'm wearing right now, like a, you know, like a, a sterling uh, bracelet here. Like a, it would just be perfect with one of, one of my outfits. So I would have no problem rocking this one. And I think it would be very cool. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you found it kind of interesting. There's been many of you that have messaged me on Instagram at the real John P as well as DelrayWatch.com and other places just saying, hey, you know, like, what would you recommend? What's on your short list? And as you can see from my list, not everything is ultra high end. Sure, going through my list here, looking at the 1016, uh, which is which is pretty high priced for, for what it is right now, as well as the, uh, the 5711 and FP Journe, yeah, those are all over um, five grand, no problem. So that it is unattainable for many. And it, it could be something that you could put on your wish list or something to save up for. But, I mean, looking at the Nomos Club, very, very attainable at that $1,100, $1,200 US dollars price point. Especially if you roll into something more popular, right? If you get the stock dial, I think you can get like a Nomos Club or a Nomos uh, Club Campus with a closed case back for probably like $800 US dollars um, naked without box and papers if you hunt for it. Once again, you need to hunt for it. But, of course... On the list, the wish list of, you know, basically a watch dealer or a business person gone watch dealer, of course I'm going to have the 5711. Of course I'm going to have some FP Journe offerings. You know, I'm not talking about a crazy, like, a crazy um, offering by FP Journe, but, you know, a modest offering. So I hope it gives you an interesting look into kind of what's on my list and the kind of vibe that, you know, that I like to introduce into my, um, my daily wear. So... I hope you did find it interesting. But thanks for watching nonetheless. Do not forget to like and subscribe. The more likes and subscriptions I get, the more I keep pumping out these videos for you. And also, if you have any very cool um, topic suggestions, I would love to hear them. It would be great if they could be something that everyone would like to see. I have had some requests of like these very minute topics that I couldn't really make a full video on. So I'm going to try to wrap all of those into one video coming in the future. A bit of a QA, but a little bit longer. And just talking about all of these kind of off vintage brands, you know, things like Galet and like Nevada Grinch and things that I probably couldn't talk for 15 minutes about because there's so little history on them. I digress, but thanks again for watching, guys. You've been chatting with John P. Ciao.